Hey guys, welcome to our third, I believe, video tutorial. Um, I wanted to bring us back into thinking about rhetoric a little bit. As we move from our unit two into our unit three, um, I want to return to thinking about argument and how you'll use it in your third project. So in unit three, you'll be taking one of your solutions from project two and thinking about how you'll persuade your audience to implement the solution. You're going all in on the solution. Uh, because of our renewed interest in rhetoric, uh, this video is going to be talking about a few elements that you'll need to start thinking about as we move forward. And just a reminder, um, the, the definition of rhetoric that we started to talk about in Unit 1 is the study of the available means of persuasion. That available means phrase is thinking about what all the different possible ways that you could persuade somebody to do something, right? To either change their behavior or change their mind, make them move in some, some new and, and, and different way, okay? So the first, um, the first thing that we're gonna talk about is the rhetorical triad. You might remember from unit one that the rhetorical triad is ethos, pathos, and logos, right? Um, ethos refers to the credibility or trustworthiness of the, the, the speaker or the author. Um, pathos refers to the emotional elements in the, the, the speech or the utterance, whatever is whatever rhetorical thing we're dealing with. Um, and logos refers to the logical progression of the speech. Keep in mind that logos doesn't refer to, to statistics, right? Or, or figures or graphs or anything like that. If, if that's hanging you up, if that's confusing you, if you want to talk more about that, um, go ahead and hit me up in office hours and we can go through that a little bit more. So. The rhetorical triad is always at play in any rhetorical utterance. No matter what out, whatever is out there, you can find ethos, pathos, and logos. Okay, um, some parts of the triad might be more emphasized than others, um, but they're all going to be there. So, given this, what's more important, what's more rhetorically sophisticated, is to think about how the rhetorical strategies can create elements of the triad. Okay, so for example. Let's think about the Sarah McLachlan puppy commercial from way back in the 90s and early 2000s. Hopefully all of you are old enough to remember when that commercial was playing on TV. Otherwise, you might have to go, go look it up. It'll come up though. Um, the whole commercial is designed to make you feel sad, right? The whole premise of the commercial is that when you see sad puppies and hear this sad song, you should feel bad and you should give money to ASPCA to make the bad things stop, okay? Um, <clears throat> the main element of this commercial is pathos. Again, ethos and logos are in there, but pathos is kind of overshadowing the whole thing. It's a little bit unbalanced, okay? So instead of this simple reductive reading of the commercial, um, let's start to pinpoint specific elements of the commercial that play into the, in, 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 into the pathos, okay? So the first thing to start talking about is the music and the imagery, right? The music, um, it's In the Arms of an Angel by Sarah McLachlan, funeral music, super sad. Uh, the music has a sad tone, it invokes, uh, evokes religious imagery, and it overall just sets the tone for, for, for the commercial. Now the images, right? Um, all the images are of sad, wounded, neglected, abused animals. Awful, awful. Um, this is an indirect appeal to the people, which means that the arguer um, appeals to the reader or listener's desire for security, love, respect, all that. Um, what this means is that ASPCA, who puts the commercial on, is indirectly saying, of course you're sad. You care about the things that are hurt. If you were hurting like that, appeal to you know, the things that you need in life. If you feel, if you were in this position, you would feel bad too, right? Um, This, uh, this could also be an appeal to humans' desire for nurture. This would only work with, a, with certain kinds of people, but for those people, this commercial would be supposedly even more rhetorically uh, significant, okay? Um, this is going a step further than just saying you care about things that are hurt by saying, of course you're sad, you want to help the animals, right? Um, it's a step beyond, okay? So now let's start to think about how this commercial is playing into logos, okay? The premise for this one is pretty weak. Um, the logical premise is essentially that if you feel sad about the puppies, that means you care about the animals, if you care about them, you wanna help them. If you wanna help them, give us money, okay? 
So basically, if you want to make the sad feeling go away, get your wallet out. The appeal, um, the appeal at play here is, is essentially a call to action, okay? They're trying to get you to actually take out your money, call them, give them money, okay? If you don't, uh, this is a version of psychology's negative conditioning. If you've had an intro psych class, you might be familiar with this, but if you've seen a kid in Target, you're also pretty familiar with what this means. Um, in this case, negative doesn't mean bad. In this case, negative actually means to subtract or take away something, okay? So in the Target, if the kid wants a toy, right? The kid finds a toy, he asks his mom for the toy. Mom says no. At that point, the kid starts screaming his head off and crying until the mom does something to make the screaming stop, okay? She buys the toy. Um, if you think about it, this is persuasive because she's actually changing her mind. She's changing her behavior. She's doing something different. The kid has, rhetorically one okay your car does this too um same thing happens with your seat belts if you start to drive without your seat belts your car will make the annoying sound the beep 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 until you click it right um, if the goal is to get your money aspca is going to do a bunch of annoying stuff until you do something to make it stop okay it's getting you to change your behavior by doing something that you don't want okay uh, the sad, this sad puppy commercial is demonstrating a rhetorical analysis, okay? So everything that we've done here is a rhetorical analysis. Um, I was breaking the commercial down into smaller components, observing them, explaining how all those components can, can come together to persuade you to do something. Um, yeah. Yeah. So next week, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing as I did here. You're going to have some student essays that are um, working to, to, to break certain things apart, and you're going to tell me how those things are working, okay? Um, so stay tuned for that. So the other thing I wanted to talk about after um, the rhetorical triad is appeals. So in this example, I've been using the word appeal a lot. Um, a rhetorical appeal is, is a kind of rhetorical device, okay? Think about the phrase to appeal to someone. Essentially, what this means is to make something appeal to someone, okay? It's a little backwards, but follow me here. If you're appealing to someone's ego, you're going to be buttering them up. You're going to be giving them compliments, making them feel confident so that you're, you're, you're giving them something that they want. You're giving them something appealing, okay? If you're appealing to someone's personality, um, you're going to say things that make them believe they fit into that certain personality. So we do this when we babysit a lot, right? Um, if you babysit or if you have little siblings, if you hang around little kids a lot, you do this all the time, okay? Um, let's say, let's say you're, you're hanging around a kid who wants to be tough, right? You tell them something, you want them to, you're trying to get them to do something that's, that's going to scare them, okay? So you might say, well, Batman wouldn't be afraid to jump into the pool. What you've done here is created the premise, Batman is tough, the kid wants to be tough, kid wants to be like Batman, kid jumps into pool right? We have, that, we have that, that rhetorical goal, that change in behavior, the thing that you want them to do. So in order to appeal to them, to appeal to what they want, you're going to create a scenario where um, they want to be like that thing, okay? You want to appeal to them. So then the last thing I want to talk about is when is something rhetorically successful and who decides, okay? In the end, how do we know if something is rhetorically successful? And the truth is that we don't know until we test it. Um, the reason for this is that the audience always decides what is rhetorically successful. So for, for, for an example of this, say my partner and I are going to the movies. Um, he wants to watch a horror movie and I wanna watch the, the new Emma that's coming out, the new Jane Austen book turned into film. Uh, being another rhetoric professor, he outlines a perfectly stunning, well-structured argument with well-founded appeals and concessions and call to actions and all that jazz, all in, all in the car, right? We get to the movie theater and I say no. Ultimately, this perfectly constructive argument fails because in the end, I didn't change my mind. We have no change in behavior, right? I'm still dead set on seeing Emma. His plan B is to whine, okay? My partner whines and fusses and pouts and acts a fool like the kid in Target until I say yes. Against all odds, the weaker argument is the one that actually worked, okay? I tell you this because 
you need to write towards the towards your audience and because when you take your newfound rhetorical skills that you've gained from this class into the world you're likely to fight for something get feedback revise it fight again get more feedback and so on the loop keeps going right um, although we can't necessarily replicate this this process in class at least not in the time that we have um, it is worthwhile to think about what appeals would work best for your audience members and to think re realistically about how you would change it next time, okay? So the three ideas that we talked about in this, uh, in this video were the rhetorical triad, appeals, and audience, and creating successful rhetoric, right? Um, if you understand the parts before you compose, hmm, that didn't make any sense. Oh, you have to understand the parts before you can compose a rhetorical utterance of your own. So check TCU, check with TCU online to see um, once we, once I've posted the student essays and um, your weekly participation assignment, if you have any questions with that, I look forward to talking to you in our Zoom class. Um, if there's anything else I forgot, I'm sure you'll let me know. Thank you guys. I appreciate your, your patience. I need to stop the video somehow. There it is.